production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences. This time on Broad and High. Explore how some local artists interpret the theme of landmarks. So they responded to not only Fort Hayes as a place, but a location and then their own ideas about place. And speaking of landmarks, we'll hit the Columbus Museum of Art to check out their latest exhibit. This and more right now on Broad and High. Welcome to Broad and High, I'm your host, Kate Manicky. If I asked you to think of a landmark in your life, you'll probably conjure up an image of a building or some type of physical structure that commemorates a specific place, say the Empire State Building or the Ohio State House. But when that same question was posed to a group of Columbus artists, many of them took a much more personal approach. Check it out. This is the Shot Tower Gallery. It's been a gallery for over 34 years and uh, here on uh, the Fort Hayes Metropolitan Education Center campus. Uh, the building is actually from 1863 and it was built the last year of the Civil War. This was actually a hub of activity for small arm repair and so uh, guns were repaired here. They're brought back after the battlefield. So the space that we're standing in was, uh, for quite some time, used as an indoor drill hall. But the site of Fort Hayes, I think, is just as intriguing as Fort Hayes. Um, it was on Cleveland Avenue, it is on Cleveland Avenue, which was known as Harbor Road. And if you think about it, it goes to the harbor in Cleveland. It's Route 3. This was a major route on the Underground Railroad through Columbus. You got out of downtown quickly, and you headed for Westerville or Worthington, or up to Clintonville. So to think about and to pass by a military base, a Union military encampment, would have been pretty safe. So my role had been to uh, help kind of interpret some of these stories. I had first started thinking about um, African-American soldiers because I don't think it's just like common knowledge that people think about African-Americans and people who were being held in slavery fighting in the war. And once I thought about putting images on the flag, it just evolved from there. And we got some posters, and I really like the, um, the recruitment posters. They were on, uh, offering freedom and protection for black soldiers. And so that's kind of what the whole piece is about. <laughs> Yeah. And maybe we can start to get some images of America, Purple Mountains Majesty, all of that. The plan would be to put the images of the American dream on here. I've got some sanding and some painting to do. I'm gonna have the, the white picket fence Three kids and a car in the garage. <laughs> White picket fence, can't you see that? Yeah. Okay, so they'll be all encased in wire. You can't get to it. It's not for you. And in reality, I don't believe the American dream was ever created for African Americans. Uh, but we fought for that dream as well, and so that's what I want the piece to represent. We fought for the dream, and we're still fighting for the dream. Um, there are many pieces that are more conceptual, and then there are many pieces that are more literal than others. Most of us think about landmarks as a physical place, uh, man-made or natural, that mark 
some location. And for the other way to think of it is a landmark is what we associate with often when we're coming of age. I'm just going to have you stand kind of in front of that flash there. Um, today I'm taking photographs of scars. I was literally on my laptop and I had all these notes out in front of me and I have a lovely scar on my knee um, from a rusty license plate when I was a child. It's very soft and I oftentimes will sit there and just kind of rub it. And so I was sitting there amongst my notes of landmarks and idea bubbles and thought books and all this stuff and I realized that's my landmark. Um, I'm doing very cr uh, tight crops on just the scars. The idea okay. is that I'm blowing out the background and so um, the, the scar itself kind of becomes its own abstract entity within the image. Every mark left on a body, no matter how insignificant or life-changing it could be, there's a story behind it and no one forgets how they got their scars. And it's, you know, I want people to feel good about the marks left on their bodies. The exhibit has um, 89 works. It's a very large show, and there are over 50 women artists from Ka in the exhibit. But many of these artists take the idea of place into many different directions, and some deal with the idea of Ford Hayes um, and, and their reaction to place, and some deal with a very personal message of place and what that means to them personally. Landmark is on view at the Schott Tower Gallery through April 15th. And you can learn more about the Creative Arts of Women Collective at cawcolumbus.com or follow them on Instagram. Melvin Edwards is a sculptor who works primarily in welded steel. He actually spent some of his formative years in Dayton back in the 1940s, and it was where he visited his first museum, the Dayton Art Institute. Now he's back in Ohio with a retrospective of his work at the Columbus Museum of Art. Melvin Edwards' work really deals with a very painful uh, history of the United States. It's uh, racial divisions, it's uh, oppression of minorities over long decades, and this is something that the country is obviously still grappling with. Edwards has made these works from 1963 onward and is still making them now. Well, the early 60s, uh, what people call the civil rights movement, was heating up in that period. And I felt, well, there shouldn't be any reason that I can't put ideas from that into my work in some kind of way to express what I felt or what I thought was important. The title of this retrospective exhibition is uh, Melvin Edwards, Five Decades. I would really love if visitors could you know, experience this exhibition and come to grips with these objects in a way that allows them to be both beautiful and painful. Well, Melvin Edwards, um, born in 1937 in uh, Houston, Texas, spent about five formative years of his life in Dayton, Ohio. Being in Dayton uh, turned out to be, in retrospect, very good for me. Ohio wasn't uh, segregated legally as mm -hmm. Texas was. Uh, it had its discriminatory realities, but uh, it was a more um, open place and experience than uh, Texas was. He primarily works with welded steel, a sculptural arrangement that is both abstract, but it also has a very powerful you know, undertone of, of social concerns, particularly to do with the civil rights movement. Most solutions to the world's problems or to an artist's problems are complex mm -hmm. and so you have to deal with them. I think I do that within my work.
Edwards is best known for a series of works that are called the Lynch Fragments. There is about 200 of them that he has made in the decades since 1963. And these works, they are a, a roughly the size of a human head. The fragments uh, that they are presented at eye level, it's the way we communicate or judge or try to understand the world through this place that our senses are. Every person's level is wherever their head is. But at the same time, it resists that because they don't necessarily look anything like a face. So you are sort of caught between this sense of, of empathy with it, a feeling like it is another person, but then a sense that this is a, a violated body. Certainly I know about chains and oppression and that, but if you're a traditional blacksmith anywhere in the world, if you make a good chain, you're an expert at uh, blacksmithing. It's just a way that human beings learn to make a stronger kind of rope. Chains of love, that's in so many songs. Uh, the point is the connection and of course, when we talk about family history, you know, we're talking about the, the linkages from generation to generation. Everybody's pretty happy about the use of the word love, but there are people out there that would love to kill you. I hope that people come away with a sense that artworks can be both abstract, but also highly meaningful. Melvin Edwards' Five Decades is on view at the Columbus Museum of Art through May 8th. And learn about the museum's Roaming Docents program, where you can casually chat about the artwork with trained museum guides. Visit columbusmuseum.org to learn more. Who doesn't like balloons? Losing our grip on a shiny new helium balloon and watching helplessly as it sails into the sky is probably a shared human experience. And then there's the beloved balloon animal, a staple of nearly every outdoor festival. So take a deep breath and check out the talent of Bobby the Balloon Man. I started twisting balloons back in 1989, so I'm going on 25 years. I worked as a professional clown, a Scooter the Clown, and I put myself through college doing birthday parties and special events. And, you know, it's funny, I always wanted to learn just for my own entertainment. I taught myself how to juggle and ride a unicycle when I was 17, just because I wanted to learn. I learned how to do some magic tricks volunteering in a magic shop when I was 14 years old. And I always wanted to learn how to do balloons. One time I was at the mall and I remembered to go into the bookstore and see if they had a book on how to do these. And they had a little book with a kit, you know, it came with a bag of balloons and a little hand pump. And it was pretty easy for me. I took to it very quickly. Right now we're at Mi Pueblo uh, in Sarasota. And I'm here twice a week. I'm here every Friday and Saturday night. Doing balloons in a restaurant is more than just going up to the tables and making a balloon for a kid. You have to be courteous to the management, the servers, you have to be aware of the customers. Um, if I'm working at a table and it's the table next to me just got sat, I'm not going to go to that table first. I have to kind of be aware of customers that are almost done with their meals who may have not gotten balloons. And, and, and so sometimes customers think that you're ignoring them, but you actually have to work around and try to hit everybody. If I just stay in one area, a lot of tables will turn over and customers will leave unhappy. I go up to the tables and I offer them the option of a list of simple things that they can pick from or a fancy surprise. I like to try to spend anywhere from five to ten minutes at a table, maybe fifteen tops. So if they if they have nine kids there, I try to keep it to the simple stuff so that I'm not there for 45 minutes. There's certain certain characters that take 20 minutes or more for me to make. 
I, I have no intentions of like working so fast to where I hurt my hands, and that is an issue, by the way. Um, doing this for so many years, pains start to set in, and the knuckles and hands, and so I don't want to work too fast. I have to try to keep it to characters that I know I can do within five to seven minutes. I have uh, like a, an, a comfortable repertoire of maybe 15 to 20 when I'm working in a restaurant that I just kind of recycle. Um, I like to stick a lot to Looney Tunes and it depends on the shape of the characters too. Like sometimes I'll look at a character and I'll say, I can, I can figure that one out and that's kind of an incentive for me to play. I've been fortunate uh, in a couple areas. I got to do an event for Janet Reno in her backyard. When she was running for governor, she was doing a fundraiser for her birthday in her backyard and I went and worked there for her and did a life-size sculpture of her. Uh, that, was, that was a fun event. So you get to meet interesting people. This is one of those things where I think that if I won the lottery, I'd still do. This is so therapeutic. I'm a licensed elementary school teacher, and even though that can be rewarding, it's also stressful at times. When I am doing this kind of work, I can interact with the kids in a different way and be more playful. It's not all down to business. So it's, it's very therapeutic. I think this is a fun hobby for anybody to pick up. It's like playing with Legos, except you're basically just making pieces out of balloons and putting them together. I recommend for people to give it a try if they want to do something creative. If you are worrying about popping the balloons, make sure you get a good quality. Uh, there are certain stores that sell very cheap ones. Those balloons won't do. They're going to keep popping no matter what. But I think that people who want to try it should try it. If you're looking at something that you're trying to create out of balloons, like for instance, when I did the Janet Reno balloon, that took some creativity and that, that is art. There are some balloon artists who think that drawing on the balloons is cheating. I, that's, that's their opinion and they're, that's okay, you know. Uh, I think that anything you want to add to the balloon is art. It's your art. You, you're the creator. Uh, some people use glue to put the balloons together. Other balloon artists think that's cheating. You know, <laughs> but art is art. It's whatever you create and whatever you're happy with. This next artist is from Milwaukee, but he's also a Kent State grad. Check out how Jack Pachuda combines ink and colored pencils to create images that leave a lasting impression. I have gotten in the last few years in, into the, uh, the realm of the birds. I have wolves, I have buffalo. It's all uh, outdoors and it's, there's a uh, there's nothing that is captive about it. It's all very free and, and very much uh, uh, birds and animals that, that roam uh, the countryside and that uh, have their own way of, of living and, and very much a freedom attached to it. My name is Jack Pachuda. I am a print artist. We use ink. We use colored pencils. We use textures. We use lots of different media to create what we want to create. As a print artist, I make mono prints. Now mono means one, so each of my prints, each of my originals is distinctive. Now yes, we can make G-Clay copies of those prints, but each 
individual print has its own textures, it has its own feel, it has its own way of impressing individuals who take a look at it. The nice thing about this is that you don't always know what the finished product will look like. The background and the foreground are done on two different presses, so the background sometimes creates an image of what you want to put on the foreground, and the foreground sometimes lets you select a background that you didn't really realize would go uh, with that foreground when you started to print. So you work back and forth, and it's a surprise kind of an art at times because you never really know what the finished product is going to look like, and you're always seeing things. You see different shapes, you see different objects, and they all go together to leave an impression. And that's exciting because it, it's serendipity. It's, it's finding something you didn't expect. I work with a uh, very high rag content paper. It's Reeves BFK, it is a French paper. It measures roughly 30 inches by 22 inches and it, it absorbs ink. That high rag content means it's almost more cloth than it is paper because when you print on it, when you use the ink and the colored pencil on it, that color is vibrant, it stays. It doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't stay on the surface, it actually absorbs in to the paper itself. So it's a, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful way to work. So everything you see is ink and colored pencil, and it's a matter of how you manipulate those two different uh, items that determines the final impression of the finished piece. But it's a very specialized colored pencil. These are Prismacolor. What that means is the Prismacolor is a very high wax content colored pencil. So you can blend colors because with that wax you can put one color on top of another color and you can blend them together to achieve a very dramatic effect. A lot of the backgrounds inspired the outdoors and right now, the, the last uh, couple of years, I have done quite a few prints with wildlife and with birds. In 1942, there were only 15 whooping cranes in the entire nation, and there was only one migrating flock. It went from Alberta and Canada down to Texas. Well, now there, there are two flocks of, of migrating cranes. One is in Wisconsin, and it goes to Florida. That's the second flock. And the reason for that is that the International Crane Foundation in Baraboo had a breeding program. Now there are roughly 200 cranes that uh, migrate from Wisconsin to Florida every year and back again, of course. So in the summer, Wisconsin is the only state in the entire nation where you will see whooping cranes. It's called whooping it up. And that's because uh, it's the mating dance. The dance of the crane is very dramatic. When you see the male and female whooping crane, they, they jump, they spread their wings, they make a very plaintive sound, and it is very distinctive, uh, something that you won't see any place else uh, in, in the world. And that's why I was inspired by that, because this is very distinctive in terms of what Wisconsin means in, in the wildlife arena. When you are printing off the image, you're printing on different backgrounds. You're, you're printing sometimes just on a, a piece of paper that doesn't have any background, and you're finishing it off as you go. You may be finishing off two or three prints at one time, each of which is unique. This is not quick. Uh, this takes a while because you are printing, you're cutting stencils, uh, you are using the pencils, you are using markers. Those two processes of, of finishing it off with, with those, uh, that's what creates the vibrant colors and, and creates the total impression of the piece. I can't tell you how long it takes because it's different based upon each individual print. If you take a look at the pooping cranes, the image of the cranes themselves is, is drafted in a very uh, very realistic way, but the background is full of textures and full of colors and full of abstract images. People will see different things in those images. Art is very personal, it's internal, it is not objective, it is subjective. So people will see different things in that piece and every one of those things that they see will be the correct thing. And everybody says it's, it's just something that is, is unique compared to the other things they've seen. Well, I think every artist should find what they like. So because of that, I, I have focused on the, the, uh, the printmaking, and I love it. It's, it's, a, it's a great way to express yourself.
that's our show. Be sure to check out our new website, WOSU.org, where you can find all of our videos. And of course, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Today we're leaving you with music by Columbus indie pop band Truslo and a track off their recent EP titled Hurricane. Be sure to come back for more great stories around Central Ohio next week on Broad and High. I'm Brian Moss. I'm a visual artist and I work at the Columbus Museum of Art. I draw comics and I paint. The most important thing I've learned about myself as an artist is that my paintings are my global voice. I try to give a voice to the people who can't be heard in the community. I think of myself as a conduit, so I like to tell their stories. I need to trust my experiences and express myself to the fullest potential regardless of how uncomfortable it makes me feel. I need nature in my life for my creative process. Columbus has the right amount of green space and the right amount of city life. I enjoy the diversity. I am Brian Moss. Painting is my art, and there's no place I'd rather make it. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And by the Ohio Arts Council, a state agency that funds and supports quality arts experiences.